This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Endotracheal extubation refers to the removal of an endotracheal tube from the trachea. This procedure is commonly performed in operating rooms, post-anesthesia care units, and intensive care units. This video focuses on extubation of the trachea following general anesthesia and short-term intubation. The many considerations required for extubation following long-term intubations are beyond the scope of this video. Endotracheal tubes are initially placed to secure an airway for the administration of anesthesia, to provide airway protection, or to provide positive pressure mechanical ventilation. Once endotracheal intubation is no longer needed, extubation is indicated. However, the decision to extubate a patient must be made carefully, particularly because respiratory and airway-related complications are more likely to occur after endotracheal extubation than after endotracheal intubation. Although many problems related to endotracheal extubation are minor, serious complications can arise. These complications include cardiovascular stress, pulmonary aspiration, hypoxemia, and even death. To minimize the possibility of complications related to the removal of an endotracheal tube, a plan for airway management is required. Endotracheal extubation is indicated when the clinical conditions that required airway protection with an endotracheal tube or that required mechanical ventilation are no longer present. Endotracheal extubation is contraindicated when the patient's ability to protect the airway is impaired, that is, the patient does not have protective airway reflexes or when the patient cannot maintain adequate spontaneous respiration, that is, the patient has persistent respiratory muscle weakness, hypoxemia or hypercarbia. Extubation may also be contraindicated in certain patients in the presence of cardiovascular instability, metabolic derangements, or hypothermia. In deciding whether to extubate the trachea, assess the patient's medical condition. Quantitative values such as respiratory rate, tidal volume, and oxygen saturation are useful indicators of extubation readiness, but you must consider all pertinent and available information. Ultimately, good clinical judgment is required. Be particularly cautious when the patient has high oxygenation and ventilatory requirements, when the patient has a history of airway obstruction, or when there has been previous difficulty in ventilating or intubating the patient. Equipment selection is guided by the need to prevent complications and to maintain airway patency, oxygenation, and ventilation. A suction device for removing airway secretions, supplemental oxygen, and an appropriately sized face mask with a bag valve device must be immediately available. Oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal airways should be readily available in case one needs to be placed to improve airway patency. The patient's vital sign should be monitored continuously. A laryngoscope, endotracheal tubes, and stylets should be available in case immediate reintubation of the trachea is necessary. An induction agent, such as propofol, and a muscle relaxant, such as succinylcholine, may facilitate emergency reintubation. Some experts recommend having other advanced airway tools on hand before performing endotracheal extubation. These include supraglottic rescue devices, airway exchange catheters, and a video laryngoscope. If ventilation with a face mask or reintubation is difficult, a supraglottic rescue device, such as a laryngeal mask airway, may allow adequate oxygenation and ventilation. In the rare event that it is not possible to ventilate or reintubate the patient after extubation, it may be necessary to establish emergency airway access by performing a cricothyroidotomy.
Thus, you should make sure that the equipment and personnel needed to perform a cricothyroidotomy are available. Endotracheal extubation is usually performed when patients are awake or have emerged from general anesthesia. Ensure that adequate pain control is being provided before extubation. If the patient is awake, a visual analog scale can be used to assess whether the degree of analgesia is adequate. Cardiovascular stability, normal acid-base status, normothermia, and intact protective airway reflexes should be present. If neuromuscular blockade was induced, make sure that the blockade has been fully reversed. In preparation for extubation, adjust the ventilator to ensure that adequate respiratory effort is present with minimal support. Oxygenation should be maximized with 100% inspired oxygen delivered through the breathing circuit. Place the patient in a semi-recumbent position to reduce his or her work of breathing and improving oxygenation. An upright position increases functional residual capacity, allowing for longer periods of apnea before oxygen desaturation occurs. Make sure that the tidal volume, respiratory rate, and inspiratory force are at appropriate levels before beginning extubation. Suction the patient's endotracheal tube using a disposable catheter or an inline suction device, and then carefully remove any tape or securing device in preparation for extubation. Avoid inducing abrupt head and neck movements, which may cause the endotracheal tube to stimulate the trachea and trigger coughing. A patient with an injury to the cervical spine may require additional neck support. Carefully suction any oropharyngeal secretions, avoiding direct dental or airway trauma. To minimize the risk that the patient will bite the endotracheal tube, which could cause occlusion of the tube or result in dental injury, a bite block or an oral airway can be used. If the endotracheal tube becomes acutely occluded, negative pressure pulmonary edema may develop, in which case the extubation would need to be postponed. Patients emerging from general anesthesia often make forceful, uncoordinated movements just before they are ready for extubation. Therefore, it is vital to protect the position of the endotracheal tube to keep the patient from accidentally self-extubating, which could cause hypoxemia. In addition, the patient's fingernails or objects such as the pulse oximeter could cause abrasions to his or her corneas if the arms and hands are not secured. When the patient is ready for extubation, attach a syringe to the pilot balloon and completely deflate the cuff of the endotracheal tube. Positive pressure ventilation with oxygen can be provided with a bag valve device during endotracheal extubation to maximize alveolar recruitment. After extubation, immediately verify that the airway is patent and that adequate spontaneous ventilation is occurring. Observe the face mask for the rhythmic condensation of exhaled breath. Phonation and speech after extubation are reassuring signs that vocal cord injury and acute glottic edema have largely been prevented. Uh, okay. Continue to provide supplemental oxygen through the face mask until the patient has fully recovered. In the next segments of the video, we will limit our discussion to extubation of morbidly obese patients and difficult extubation. There are many other clinical situations in which endotracheal extubation can take place that are not discussed here. For example, nasal extubation, pediatric extubation, and extubation following prolonged intubation. Extubation of morbidly obese patients who have obstructive sleep apnea must be accompanied by enhanced readiness to support ventilation and maintain airway patency. Be sure such a patient is fully awake and able to respond appropriately to commands before extubation. Upright positioning of the patient is strongly recommended so that the excess body tissue on the chest and against the diaphragm is displaced caudad, which will reduce the work of breathing and increase the functional residual capacity.
When you have had difficulty in ventilating a patient through a face mask or intubating a patient, special consideration is required prior to extubation because the management of a failed extubation can be extremely challenging. Surgical factors such as the need for a patient to spend a long time in the prone position or the need for direct surgical manipulation of the airway and medical factors such as angioedema may increase the difficulty of airway ventilation or intubation. If continued intubation is deemed safer than mechanical ventilation, adequate sedation and cardiopulmonary monitoring should be maintained. Document the plan and communicate it clearly to the patient's medical team. Although few extubation-related complications are life-threatening, hypoxemia is the common pathway to severe complications. In the period immediately after extubation, early respiratory insufficiency may be caused by poor ventilation or residual neuromuscular blockade. Bronchospasm and severe coughing can also impair adequate ventilation. Both conditions can be treated with topical or intravenous local anesthetic agents, intravenous opioids, or bronchodilators as indicated. Acute upper airway obstruction may be caused by laryngospasm, especially in children. Vocal cord dysfunction is a rare cause of airway obstruction and, if present, may require immediate reintubation. Suspect vocal cord dysfunction if the team thinks that the recurrent laryngeal nerves might have been injured. Patients with laryngeal edema due to prolonged intubation or direct glottic compression can present with delayed airway obstruction and inspiratory stridor. Impaired airway and swallowing reflexes can pose a risk of pulmonary aspiration. Manipulation of the airway is usually noxious for patients, causing increased myocardial demand. Pretreatment with opioids or beta blockers can reduce this catecholamine-mediated stress. If the medical indications that led to intubation have not been adequately resolved, progressive decompensation may occur after extubation, ultimately leading to reintubation. A tracheostomy is generally indicated if safe extubation cannot be achieved in 7 to 14 days. Endotracheal extubation should be performed without causing trauma while maintaining adequate oxygenation and ventilation. Appropriate equipment for suction, ventilation, and reintubation should be available. If extubation is judged to be unsafe, the procedure should be postponed and the patient should be reevaluated. Most complications related to extubation are preventable. Before performing extubation, the clinician must carefully prepare the medical resources needed to address foreseeable complications. A failed extubation can lead to a precipitous deterioration in the patient's condition, and attempts to improvise solutions under these challenging circumstances are rarely satisfactory.